Start the recording. Yo, what's going on, bro? Not much. How are you? Man, it's um it's going. Busy as fuck, man. It's fucking I bet. Cool. Yeah, seeing you're gearing up for season two, right? Yes, sir. You're on it right now. You know, All right. so it's just the dopeness, man. It's like you the second guest in season two. So nice. Kind of fitting, you know, season two, second guest. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> two two. Yo, man, it's been um it's been dope though. How's your how's your summer, man? How's been how's your summer been? The summer was great. So I'm a substitute teacher in Harrisburg. So over the summer I really wasn't doing much. I was kind of focusing on my songwriting. I got into that about a year ago. Right. So over the summer I was just relaxing, kicking it with my niece and nephew, working on music, work work definitely most important working on myself. That's what's up. So let everybody know, like, as far as the type of music you're working on. Okay, so my music's pretty much rap music, and the main pillars of the content of what I'm sharing is pretty much my journey through addiction with drugs, also an undiagnosed mental illness, and then also being diagnosed and then going through therapy, past trauma, just going through those type of things. So pretty much like last winter and this summer, has been a real big bulk of just working on me, going to therapy, expressing myself through music and writing and those things, those outlets. So how did you how did you get to that? I guess that that dark place. What happened? Uh, if I have to look back, I would say, like the first dark time I felt probably was after I graduated from college. I played football there, and I. I would, I did well enough to have some workouts for the NFL coming out and obviously they didn't go well. I got injured in the first two workouts and then I kind of flared out. And then I, I would say I got into drinking more readily, like maybe because I was never a big drinker. I would only drink like after wins and, and football and stuff like that once a weekend. But then I think that kind of took me down a road of, okay, let's hang out with these people. And they weren't happy either. So I felt comfort in that, but it wasn't the right place. I was in the bar all the time. And then that kind of shifted towards a good friend of mine. He, His brother was like taking uh, Percocets, painkillers. And he was like, try one of these. And I I never tried them because I, I never had a ser- serious enough in, uh, injury in football or anything. So I tried it. I was like, wow, this thing's crazy. But that drug is, <laughs> as many know, it's linked to heroin. So basically just I'll tell you a little run through a little bit of story, just how I got into the addiction thing. So I started taking, you know, pills here and there. I was unhappy with myself because I, growing up, I always saw myself as playing football. Like that was my dream. And once that kind of passed me, I kind of fell into that spiral down and then alcohol then transitioning into painkillers and then painkillers your tolerance gets so high that you're taking I don't know 100 milligrams a day and you can't keep up with it financially unless you have a good job at the time I didn't have the best of job I was still trying to go get my master's as well which is there was just so much going on like kind of I was like I was using the pill to like the, the Percocets to like kind of like motivate me in a false sense to just like get through the day because I was so miserable and so down most of the time that like without it I didn't have the, like the pill literally became my motivation and then that's when the tolerance went up high and then it kind of I didn't have the money so then kind of turned to my friend that introduced me he started selling heroin and then he was like, it's the same thing and all that. And then it went down. Those dominoes fell. And then I was stuck in it every day, all day for a few years. Yeah. Wow. So what were you doing to afford this addiction? Oh, I was doing. So I was working. I, I always worked, even when I was deep in an addiction. So I had that. Then, like, if times got hard, you know try to look around, find stuff that like find pills or whatever that you don't do that you could sell for money for what you what what your drug of choice is or there was times where I was there was a time where I was like 
I like kind of like stuck up this younger kid that was selling coke and I just wanted the coke to sell it so that I could get what I wanted I didn't want it for you know so it was kind of like that and then then it came into things like that were way beneath my character which I thought but when you're in the middle of addiction you do whatever but and then I was turning to like even just like taking some of my father's pills not all of them because I know he needed them but just even to take something from somebody without asking was nothing that I ever did before. So like, yeah, it had me in a real deep, dark place and kind of, I was undiagnosed with bipolar disorder, which I got diagnosed. Uh, that was last July. So a little bit over a year ago, I got diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So that whole time, I think it was pretty much, I can look back to like even being like a teenager and stuff like that. I was always so, my moods were always so up and down. I didn't know how to accept defeat. Like it just outraged me. Like I never wanted to lose in anything. And those were like the little signs that I, I can look back and pick to because like it wasn't normal. I'm talking, it wasn't even if it was against somebody like a human. If I lost against a computer, I'd be like out of my mind. So like those were just little things. But I think, like, throughout my life, like, sports really kept me in check, like, with it, because it kept me just, like, focused on things. And when I'm focused on things, that's when then my mind's not wandering. You know what I mean? I'm somebody, I have a very active mind. And it's, like, two phases. Like, if I'm depressed and, and my mind's active, now I'm just thinking of all negative stuff. So why did I do that to that person back then? Like, I wish I could, like, all these things. And then if I'm in a manic mood my, and my mind's running, then it's just, like, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do this. But it can also turn into, like, kind of like a, like a paranoia as well if you're too manic. Like, because you're thinking of so many different, like, there's like one thing, but you're thinking of four different outcomes. <laughs> like, and that's why I was, it's, it's very like, and I still deal with that now, but I have kind of, you know, the tools in place. And also I go to talk therapy and all those things. So now I can, I understand the disease more than when I was undiagnosed. Obviously I didn't even know I had anything. So like that, like, that's why, in my music, the biggest message is mental illness and addiction because they go hand in hand in my mind. Yeah. And like, I don't like, even when I think about it, I, I think like they say like people are like more susceptible to being addicted to things. I think it's more of a sense of they're sick either in their body, in their mind. And that thing is a bandaid that drugs abandoned because you can control how you feel. I could, when I was doing heroin every single day, I knew what my mood would be like because I knew what the heroin would, how it made me feel. It wasn't the best of moods, but I can control it. That's, that's where like the big thing that I look into, like people, yeah, they, they're taking drugs, they're getting high, but it's, they, they, they're in control in their mind of what they're doing and their emotions because they know what that drug will, how it will alter their thought process. Man, so you, what age did you start doing the, start doing drugs your first, your first time? Uh, I would say I probably first started drinking, not all the time, but first time, probably seventh or eighth grade, probably drank for a few years. I probably started smoking marijuana, maybe junior, senior year, high school. College was just drinking and, and doing and smoking that's it and then like i said once i had that you know those trials that i went through like with heat i just kept getting injured and injured throughout my my workouts for the nfl and then i kind of was working a job that i didn't want to do and then like i guess it started clicking like me feeling that that's when i started feeling like i was out of control so you feel like you know you getting injured not being able to really fulfill your dream, that was your major trigger for you as far as your depression setting in you? Uh, I would, I don't even think it's the, the goal. I think it was, like I said, like how sports kept me like focused 
scheduled, not much time to, on my own, not much time to party or do whatever. And I was just always just like bang, bang, bang. And I played literally every sport I possibly can since I was could play sports. So it was always like that. So then it was such a shock when it was done for me. And I was like, what's next? Kind of. Yeah. 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 At that point, you know, you, you, your plan A was just playing ball. Yeah. That was, was the plan only B. plan. Yeah. There was, there was none. I, I was always intelligent. So I always did not like super well throughout school, but I did B's at least. So like, I it never challenged me, so I was just like, oh, I just got to do it so I can play sports. So, like, there was there was nothing else that I even thought about in my mind, like, oh, I'd like to do that. It was always just this ball has been in my hand since I can remember. Like, that's what I love doing. And I think, like, also another thing for when sports ended was that the high that you get on game day is, right. like, I'm – I've done a lot of drugs, not many compared to it. And it's an all natural one. It's all adrenaline and every, like, and all the preparation that you put. It's just like, if you never played sports, it's kind of hard to like describe it. But if you, it, it doesn't matter if you had a fifth grade basketball championship, you were, <laughs> you were, you were feeling that adrenaline, right. you know, or even, and it also helped me get over like my phase of being like, nervousness like the anxiety like i was i had like i think i had anxiety well i do have anxiety but i think i had it since i was a little kid because i always had butterflies but after just doing something so often you become so confident they kind of went away but then those things came back once sports was not there anymore you know the confidence slipped because i tied my confidence to my performance on the field so it was like if i had a good game oh my confidence was up up in the, but if I had a bad game, then it was down. Like, I tied it to that. And then once that was gone, I had nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, that's, that's, that makes a lot of sense, actually. And especially with anxiety, you know, you know, like you said, you have those butterflies. You have those moments that you're confused about what you're feeling with mm -hmm. anxiety. You, know, you, can't, you don't know exactly what it is. You know no. It's going on. You just don't know what the fuck it is. And sometimes you can't even pinpoint the triggers of it because sometimes you just wake up and you just feel some shit <laughs> i honestly i'll give you a true true thing today i went i had a little anxiety moment for probably about 30 minutes i seen a friend of mine played ball with him he had a uh wedding yesterday and i felt i, I felt kind of left out i was like oh i see all my homies here what was that what was my invitation so like for like a good 30 hour today i was like not mad at him, but I was just like questioning, like, so what's up? Like, like, you know what I mean? I wasn't mad at him in any sense, but I was just like, what's up? I didn't even know they were getting married. So like, you are going to have times where you feel a little uneasy, but like I said, like, I'm very, very motivated about like therapy, talk therapy, because until you can sit down, figure out the triggers, you, you, you can't win. You won't win because you don't know, like, just through, like, you know, about the last year of I've really been in the, like, looking inward about myself. Like, I had my first manic episode. I, I obviously, I went to the hospital. I spent, like, six or seven days there. And then I had another one maybe two days after I got out, and I spent maybe 11 days in a new hospital. But that time was, like, 17 straight days of just looking at myself through all different types of artistic drawing painting writing music poetry anything any form of creation because then it allowed me to look back and think how how, how can i fix this and where did it go wrong and all that so it's kind of a gift from the curse then at that point Ah, uh, yeah, it's definitely, it's way bigger of a gift to me. And throughout this process, I definitely became way more closer to God than I was when I was a real young kid, but just through, I don't know, it was just through like a lot of deaths in my family and stuff like that, that I kind of fell away from God.
but through this, you know, journey the past year of looking into myself is I, I'm not enough. I can't do it on my own. Like I needed, I needed that other person, which is God in my life because you can't do it. Some days you're tired. And right. if you don't have anyone else to reach out to, it's hard to be successful. No, you're right. Everyone needs help. Everyone needs kind of that person, that right hand man. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. when you speak of, you know, we were going through it, just, it just sounds like, and you say, you know, there's a lot of deaths in your family. There's a lot of stuff that in your journey, there's just kind of a lot of triggers there. A lot of stuff that just kind of puts you in places of un insecurity and unsure. And, you know, I can see where the anxiety could come in. I can see where the path to addiction will fall into there as well to try to get away from all of that. Yes. Yes. If it seemed like growing up, like get close to people, they pass away or I only met one grandparent. Like it was a lot like, so like there wasn't many state stable people that I could just like link onto my mom and dad. They worked all the time. So it was kind of like, I would just buy my, my brother was six, seven years. So he'd pick on me. So I'd stay away from him. And then my sister, she was in high school. So she watched me, but then do her own thing. So it was kind of like, I felt like on my own a lot, even yeah, pretty much was almost early the time, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. like, Oh yeah. When you, when I never, you, when you sorry, feel that way, like, you know, yeah, when you feel that way, cause you, I was always actually a very similar path as well. My, my siblings were 10 years older than me. So I was like, they were just moving out and I was just, you know, going to become a preteen. Mm -hmm. And you are kind of raised up only, almost like an only child. Cause at that point, they're so old, you, know, you don't feel like they're really your siblings. So there's no connection. Yeah, you know? and they're so busy. Yeah. yeah, and they're just going through. They're going through their shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now, now I know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh huh. So does bipolarism or anxiety run in your family? Or, or they, is this something that you became aware of, or is it just uniquely to you? Uh, no, it definitely definitely runs on my mother's side of family. Her. My mother's twin sister, my aunt, she got diagnosed with bipolar maybe three, four years ago. She had a son, my cousin. He's, he was diagnosed with like anxiety, ADHD, a lot of different illnesses. So I, I really think it definitely did come from my mother's side for sure. Gotcha. But it, it, like, it helps just to even have an aunt being you know, diagnosed that way. I go over... You know, you can relate. It's nice. Absolutely. That's, that's huge, especially when it's family like that. Mm -hmm. It can definitely guide you through any type of process, especially when you have anxiety or bipolar and, and say, hey, this is this is my days when they're rough. And these are my days when they're good. And these are the days that I'm kind of both. <laughs> yeah. And there's days like that. There's like one of the biggest thing is I don't think it's for everybody that has bipolar, but I'm very sensitive to weather. So if I wake up and I open the blinds and it's raining, I'm already in like down mode. I wake up, open the blinds and it's sunny, no clouds. Now I'm already like pre main like I'm playing music. I'm like, like immediately right out of the bed, ready to go. And it's so crazy that just those, but just for me to know those triggers helps me a lot. Right. Wow. That's interesting. That means you need to move someplace sunny. Yeah, I actually, I, I actually have in mind that in a, my my plan in a in a couple of years is to move out towards the San Diego area, Southern California. I have a lot of team, old teammates from college that live out there. They love it. I'm actually going out to visit this February, so check out some places and whatnot. So, with your addiction, how far, how far did it go? Like, how how bad did it get? And how did, how did your family get involved? How did you not allow them to okay. get involved? You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, I would say the addiction got so bad that I had to be at work at 9. I was waking up 5.30, shower, drive an hour and a half to my man's, get my drugs for the day, drive back, make it to work. And that, that was the everyday thing. Mm -hmm. That was it, because I didn't know nobody yet where I was living, I didn't know nobody like that. So all I knew was my, my good friend and he sold it. So I knew like that. So it was a, 
drive. It was basically a two hour drive up and not up and back. Yeah, up and back's two hours, basically. So I would do that, go to work, you know, and then fall, save some for later on, then fall asleep, wake up, do the same drive again, do the same. It was uh, so exhausting. And I had to, every single day, I had to basically in my mind schedule out what time I have to leave, what time I have to get back, how much time I have in between. And it was so over. It, just to tell you, it was, now that I look back, it's so overwhelming. It's, it was like crazy, insane. And then how how my fam- my family found out. So at the time, I was staying with my mother and my father at their new place out in, in by by Harrisburg, close to Harrisburg, and whatnot. And I guess my father he found like empty bags, like heroin bags. So when I got home the one day, I was already high. I already had more stuff in my pocket for the rest of the day. And my whole family's there, and you know they're just like you need, you need to get help or stop. And I was just like, I was already prepping like for three or four weeks. I was already buying uh, subs. They're called sub sublingual. I don't know what they're. Oh no, suboxone. That's what it is. And that's what they use to get you off of like either Percocets or heroin or whatnot. So I was already buying these to like prepare myself because I like. I was winding it down in my head. Like I got to stop. Like somehow I didn't know how I was going to, right? because I did it for three or four weeks. If I was really intent, I would have did it right. You know, first week. So it was in my mind. But then when I got home, my family was there, you know, we had to sit down, said either you have to stop or you have to go get help. This time I just stopped. I stopped for about, I said probably it was about a year. I stopped. No, nah, not a year. Probably about eight months, and then I ended up relapsing. I took some Percocet. I didn't. I never went back to the heroin, but I I got some Percocet. Probably I probably did that for two or three weeks, and just one day I I like this week like I went to work. I'd come home. I was living in Philadelphia at the time. I'd come home and I literally just went to sleep get up for work and just like literally just sleep as much as I possibly can I was like there's something wrong and I spotted that in like the first two days so I just called my job told them I quit I drove back to my parents house yeah and I was just like <laughs> I, like I'm, I'm like I can't do it there like I'm depressed and then I went to the doctors this is I was still undiagnosed at this point I go to the doctors they diagnosed me with uh moderate or uh, yeah moderate depression so in between mild and major and how most i I write read a lot of literature about the disease and mental illnesses throughout the past year just because i want to become more comfortable with it and the things that i have and all those those things but basically they prescribe me uh an antidepressant but this is usually when people get diagnosed with bipolar it usually happens in this fashion so they diagnosed me with antidepressant which i was taking i was still drinking on which you're not supposed to and then i'd say about three or four months down the way i had my first manic episode but bipolar patients usually get diagnosed as depressed first and then they take the antidepressant which kicks them into mania because you're not supposed to take an antidepressant if you're bipolar so it put me into a manic episode, and then I finally got, I went to the hospital for two days, 17 days, I think, or 18 days, in fact, got me on the right meds, did all those things, like we talked about, all those therapy things, all those different right. creative things. But then, yeah, once I was on that, then from then on, I got, so that was end of July last year, I haven't drank any alcohol since then, I haven't done any drugs, I, so. Here I am. So I'm like 14 months sober and no, no, no drugs or alcohol. And it feels good. Clarity is bad. Congratulations, uh, Congratulations on that shit. That's, that's thank great. you. The biggest thing is I've woke up for 14 months straight all those days without a hangover. <laughs> that, that is the number one thing that I love about sober living. 
is I don't wake up and I'm not like, oh man, I, how am I going to get through this day? No, I wake up fine. Prep so, for the day. When you got diagnosed, of course, you, know, you were addicted to these other drugs. Mm-hmm. Were you afraid to take more drugs to help you? Uh, yeah. Were you concerned? Because you? I even, even when I quit, and the, a funny story, another anxiety story. Uh, I got out like the set. The second time I was in the hospital, I got out and I was over at my aunt's house and I was like, man, I have like a bad headache. And she was like, here's like Advil or whatever, which a lot of the pills that like, unless you get the pure Percocet, but a lot of them are they're mixed with like acetaminophen, which is a ingredient in Advil and Tylenol and whatnot. But anyways, long story short, I took it and I guess in my own head, I kind of like freaked myself out. And I had like kind of a short anxiety, and then I was like, "What, what, what am I freaking out about? Like this is t- t- Tylenol, but that's what it does to you." But I was like, oh, I'm fine." And then after that, I kind of like, as the months went on, I was kind of thinking to myself, oh, "I hate taking all these pills because I already took how many pills throughout my life." But I know. I can even feel if I go two, three days off of the medicine, I can feel it ramping up. So like that and just the knowledge of that, I just, I have to do it. It's where it's just right now with medicine, maybe down the line, it might change and I might not have to take all these pills, but right now I have to do it because if I don't uh, maybe go back to drugs or do something great, like, because when I'm manic, like, it's me versus the world type thing attitude right. and like ideas are running. And if I think somebody's getting in my way, I'm telling, I'm very like, like it's so without the medicine, I know like problems can arise. And I never felt like that mania before until that first time. And once I felt that I was like, wow, that's some, I never felt that before. So like, I know how strong it is and I know, where I was without medicine, which was doing drugs, barely holding on, it's no hope. So I'll take, I'll, t- I'll, I'll do the pills for now. Yeah. Wow. So that's and- my answer on that. Yeah. But yeah, at first it was a little like, because I did so many that it was like, you know, I don't really want to do this, but I know I have to. And how does therapy fall into play with that? How does the therapy session work? And then also how does your, I guess re-engagement with God plays part as well. How is that part, part of it? Okay. Uh, so therapy, uh, it's, it's great for me, at least. It might not be for you. I, I'm someone that likes to talk, but I, which was funny. I love to talk, but I never would talk about my feelings to no family, no friends, no anyone. But like, so that gives me like, and it wasn't even that I didn't want to tell them. It's just I didn't feel comfortable. Once I sat down with the ther- therapist for, you know, eight to ten sessions, I'm, I'm pouring everything out to the, my therapist. Then it becomes easy to do. If you just watch something, it's hard to do if you're just watching something. But once you sit down and you actually do it and talk about your feelings and all of those things, right. it becomes easier. And then just your relationships around you flourish because now you're open. But I like, like we were talking about like the life of addiction, it definitely, it makes you so close because you're trying to keep that mask on, trying to keep everybody off the radar. I should say that I think therapy just helps you just to, you know, open up, give you a platform and, and it, it it says to yourself, like, it's okay to talk about your feelings or like, even if they're negative towards somebody, I let them know now. I would never let them know in the past because I, I don't want to hurt their feelings, whatever. But like through therapy has definitely empowered me to speak what's on my mind. So everyone knows. Right. And I think that also helps with the anxiety thing because it, like if you have anxiety about seeing a person or how they act towards you, if you let them know, then it's probably going to lessen that. <laughs> or they're going to walk out of your life, which is, is okay. Either or. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's something that, yeah, you have to disclose with somebody. That's something that someone has to decide again. Like, yeah, you know what, you know, how do I 
I want to say deal with it, but honestly, it is kind of like that. How do I deal with that? How do I deal with this person if they go into a manic state, like you said? Or, you know, you go to the super depression state or you go to this bipolar state. You know, that can, that can weigh on somebody else a lot. You know, oh, a lot yeah. of the person is going, going through it. So it's like you have to be conscious of that. And you have to be up front. Because that's what you want to do is scare somebody away. Just, they fucking label you just as being crazy. Yeah. And uh, uh, let me add something on to that. Like, I, also, I was always someone, if someone asked me, like, yo, you want to go here? I'd be like, yeah, I'll do that with you. Just, you know, I go along. I was always spontaneous. But, like, then I would, I would do that with, like, past relationships. And I'd be miserable. And I would just do it just to appease them. But then my miserable because i know what mood i'm in and i just try to keep it keep it all in check but sometimes you just have to tell say no i'm not i'm not up i'm not up for it yeah and i definitely like i said like therapy has definitely empowered me to say no no i have to take care of myself no if i'm not up for it well yeah you have to you have to be you have to have that level of awareness mm-hmm I feel like at this point, from your story, you have that level of awareness now from before. You kind of just lost. That awareness was... Oh, yeah. You had a gut feeling something was going on, but you don't know what the fuck it was. hmm You know what I'm saying? Do you, do you fear to say, if you have children, that that gene is going to uh, be passed on? And- yeah, I actually thought about that. My ideas on that are actually, I definitely want children. So like in the process of me learning as much as I can about the disease myself in relationship to myself and my life is that I can pass that information on to a, maybe it's a cousin, maybe it's not a direct, but down the road, I'll have that knowledge. That's what, that's the, like, I don't want something to not know about it. <laughs> like that. Yeah. So I want to impact, like right. engage into it learn everything I can. So then, like you said, yeah, I mean, that'd be bad. You wouldn't want to wish that. But with me having that knowledge is I think that's, they would be a lot more susceptible for success than failure. If, if a parent has that much knowledge and what they're dealing with. So the time you spent those 17 days and you were being artistic and just kind of open with your emotions at that point, and being free, where well, you had to go get up for nine to five, you didn't have to rush to to get the drug of choice that that morning. You know what I'm saying? You got up, you were around other people. Was that when you started writing your music? Like when when did that that piece of music hit hit you? Uh, the music hit me. It was like one morning, early in the morning, like six or seven in the morning, and one of the nurse just walked by, and she was like. She gave me a notebook and she was like, I was like, what's this for? She was like, oh, if you want to journal or whatever. And I was like, okay. And I didn't like, I didn't open the book like thinking, oh, I'm about to write a song. I just opened the book and I started just thinking of stuff and I started just writing my true emotions. And I look, I was like, wow, this, hold on, this is coming together. <laughs> this sounds pretty good. <laughs> and then I just kept it going from there until today because it makes me what music like the creation of music and me writing the music out it's just lets me i i'll just go out sit outside and i'll just focus in and i'll just think about a situation or trauma or whatever but just that time allows me to go back and process it because i know i didn't process it when i was eight nine ten twelve i don't even know what process was so the music it's so like i get to just think back about people in my life that affect me good or bad like it just it's just a refresher of my mind which i was like so blinded and deaf for whatever four years of addiction so now it just allows me let me look back and just process everything and see why i'm here where i where do i want to go and those things so yeah, it was just it was just from a, a nurse passing me a notebook, and I don't know. I started writing. I wrote a song, <laughs> and then it went from there. Did, does the music make you feel the way you felt on the on the, on the field, or close to it? Uh yeah, 
yeah, it gives me, it doesn't give me that same feeling, but it gives me such an anticipation of once I put out a song that I can't wait for feedback because I like the music isn't for me to like, you know, one may one day make money or one day become famous. It's the music to me is pouring my journey into the music. So if someone's on a similar journey, they can make it or they can see, Oh, that person made it. They were right there where I was. So I, in my music, I talk about things, you know, I'm not, I don't accept about myself, but I did it. So, and I know that it will help people down the road. That's like that. That's where like, it's not the same feeling as sports, but it's like my passion is in it because I know I, the, the wor words are so powerful. They're so, it, it, it doesn't even matter if they're written down or if they're spoken to you. They're very, very powerful in how you say it. And the biggest thing, one of the biggest things, let me take us back is when I was first trying to come over addiction. So like day one through 10, which was brutal, back hurting, cold sweats, heat sweats, laying in the bathtub, all that stuff. I listened to, uh, what was his name? Hold on. Chris Heron. He played in the NBA and he became a heroin addict and eventually now he turned it around. And he, he goes around, and he speaks to classrooms. But I watched his 30 for 30 in his interviews every single day because I could see it. He was an athlete. He fell set. So I, I could connect to that. So I just sit, sit, watch him, listen to him, hear the words, hear the pain. And that became so motivating to me, just interviews of this man, like right. that I said, oh man, if I can make music in my journey and share it just basically it's a little journey but it's the same journey different locations same journey but if he did that to me I can do that for others through music and I've always loved music so it's just it just became I don't know it just became it it was natural and I never tried it before I never like I like when teenagers like freestyle rap I'd never do that I was never comfortable I never would write. My friend, he was real big into music. He wrote, but I never tried it. And then just this one day, I was in the hospital. He gave, she gave me the book, and now the rest is history. No, I've, I've listened to a lot of your songs already, man, and um, it's um, it is uplifting. You know, you 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 have this 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 sense of music to where, to your point, you're really telling a true story. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's coming out, and you hear that in your lyrics. You know what I'm saying? Uh, from the songs I heard, and that's just going to take you further and help help people, like you said, figure out. Hey, you know what? He's either went through or he's fairly still fresh in his recovery. And I think a lot of times people tend to not connect, even if people who had addiction but they're years removed. When someone's still fresh in it, it's kind of hard for them to make that connection. They see that you see that. Hey, this person made the summit. They made the mountaintop. But where's that person who's still fresh in it, two or three levels above me, that can really still connect with me? And I feel like you say that within your music to where people feel like, hey, this is still fresh for him too. He's still working on it. And that connection can be made. Does that make sense to you? You know what I'm saying? Oh, I, I completely, I completely understand what you're saying. Like, because like, it's so fresh to me that <laughs> any day I could go back. Right. Any day. I'm not trying to go back. I never want to see that road again. But it's such it's so strong because it's connected to our brain. The, the drugs and the substances are connected to the chemistry in our brain. Once you alter that, it's hard to get out of it. And if you get out of it, <laughs> it can alter real quick right back. So, yeah, like I want, like you said, fresh out of it. Grab on to me. Grab on to my lyrics, whatever. If it motivates you, if it's whatever it may motivate you to do. If it just gives you just a, a little bit of sight of hope, then I'm proud of that. So you say the music is really just for you to just get out your feelings, right? How yeah. far do you really want to go with it? Music? Yeah. I would love to, I would love to get it to get to a standard or a step where it could be worldwide like that my music can be accept accessible worldwide 
if they want to access it, that's on them. But I want to make it so I'm on a platform that if somebody in North Russia needed it, they could get it. So okay. it's not really based on like how well my music does. It's more of I I w- I just want to see the widespread of it because I think it's very crucial. And I don't think many artists are talking about that if at all. No, you have a lot of just kind of current things that's happening or just kind of bubblegum rap. You know what I'm saying? Like you know, just whatever hit. Just anybody who could just make a fucking hit, pretty much. And that's it. That's what you were looking for. Yeah. Instead of looking like for true, you know, like body and soul, you know what I'm saying, mindset, you know, like kind of reconstruction and you're connecting with that with your words, you know, which is, which is going to be huge. And it's a game changer too. And I think that's what a lot of people understand. Like, you know, there's a lot of famous like artists, you know, and that's it. They're bad. They're great. I love them too. But there's a lot of underground artists that can really move you when you find them like, yo, this is, this is my motherfucker right here. I got to fuck with him. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's like, he's saying, or she's saying everything that I've gone through. They, they get it. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Completely. Which I know is, what you're saying. Yeah. And like to that, that it might not be popular, but it's what you can connect with. That's what I'm saying. Like with my music, like, if if I became famous, great. But if I didn't, that's fine as long as that my music is stable on a platform that someone could find it one day if they need it. Yeah, and that's and I think that's a that's a key because you're doing it from a, a real straight place, bro. You know what I'm saying? You're doing mm-hmm. it straight from the heart. You're doing it from experience. You're not putting any fluff into it. You know, and and for you to even share your journey now. It takes a lot of fucking strength, bro. So I give you kudos for that. Thank so you. I appreciate it. This, to even bring it up, to talk about it, and mentally still be strong to say, after this conversation, I'm not going to go get some shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, no, like, and all this is, uh, like, like on that point is, last night, my girlfriend, she invited me out to a brewery and whatnot. I sat there, and I'm strong enough to where I'm at is, like, Nothing is gonna, nothing is gonna persuade me. If I, if I make that decision, it's gonna be on me. Like be around me, party around me, girls around me, whatever. I could be on in any, and not everybody can. I'm not saying <laughs> go ahead and do right. that, but I'm just saying once you are strong mentally and you know what's going on in your head, it's easy. I don't want to downplay it and say it's easy, but I'm, it's easy to make the right choice. I should say. Right, it's just it's just making that choice. Yeah, mm-hmm. and not allowing others to make that choice for you. Right. Now you referenced the guy you were getting the drugs from as your friend. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, where is he now, and how's that relationship? You guys still friends? Oh yeah, we're still friends. We talk almost every day. I'm not somebody. I made my own choices. Like, okay. yeah, he he supplied it, but I was the one asking for it. You know what I mean? So. I, I would say once I got into the hospital, I took probably like six to eight months of no contact with nobody that I was just, you know, family in my own head, working on myself. And then, you know, eventually reached out. So no bad feelings. I mean, I would watch myself about like the com- other company around him, maybe, but I'm, I'm comfortable with, you know, still being his friend, telling him things and, you know, helping him out when he needs. I can't turn my back on anybody, to be honest, like, because I needed the help at one point so bad. And others do too. How did your family feel about that, though? Did they feel like maybe that was a kind of slippery slope for you? What? Uh, before being, that happened? Just being friends with him still. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like Afterwards? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sure they're a little nervous or whatnot, but I mean, I'm not like, I used to be like, we're, we're still really good friends, but I used to be, you know, going up, hanging out with them all the time. I haven't seen them in a few months. Like we play on Xbox and stuff like that, right. but no, hanging out. Yeah. I don't hang out with him daily because yeah. in in my mind, that would be a stupid decision. Also, he he's not doing anything, but just, you know, same location triggers like we were talking about before. Yeah, exactly. You never know. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and that's, I think that's where people have to really figure out for themselves what they can and can't handle. 
you know what I'm saying? Like for you, if you're willing to handle that and you feel like maybe that's you keeping it in your face as a reminder, hey, he's like that reminder, I'm gonna keep him close to what the fuck I don't want to do anymore. That works for you as dope, but if you're not if you you're not that type of person, you need to figure something else out. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. No, yeah, I wouldn't say many people to go do that, hang out with someone that you used to get drugs from or whatever <laughs> or the case may be. But yeah, like you said, yeah, it's it's everything is subject to subject. It's your personal preference, what you think you can stand up to, what you're strong enough. Like to me, like also to elaborate more on your point about with God and faith, like I think like another thing I was doing those drugs because I was in misery. I didn't see any hope. Now that I incorporated God back into my life, it's just, it's not like it, I'm thinking of something way larger conceptually than myself that I'm working for. Like, without that the times where i when i didn't have god it was so self-centered it was jacob jacob that's the only thing that mattered was me and then i would say once i became clean got god i go to church every week you know read my bible and whatnot that it shows me like i said to my girlfriend she was like you going to church the other week she was working i was like yeah i'm going to church i said if i can't give him an hour of my time in an entire week then what am I going there for? Because I was, I did have, because I was kind of like depressed that morning. It was a muggy and I was like, oh, I don't really feel like going. She's not going. But I still went because it, like for me, the religion, God holds me accountable right. to do good. Right. And in my mind, that just seems like something that would be positive for most people. Yeah, so, no yeah I yeah. think what you did was you found a bunch of things that, between the music, between your faith, you know what I'm saying, to reevaluate your friendship, your friendships, to really formulate a circle that's going to give you the energy you need to go forward in a good in a good sense. Mm-hmm. And if if that's faith, that's fantastic. If it's not, that's fine too. Like people do really have to look at see that, that another issue. But I think what people have to understand when you look at someone, and like you did you said about this guy with the thirty for thirty, right? And you saw his story. It, it wasn't your story. There was a lot of parallels, but it wasn't your story. And people had to understand that where they had to look at it and say, you know what, I, I can do the same. Or I can do better for myself and not live through that person's story and not look at because they may feel along the way that they don't see themselves as true failures because they're not there as of yet. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? No, yeah. And, you know, it makes sense. You know, what I'm saying like, so you really have to look at yourself and say, "Hey, I'm going to be successful. I want to do me." And it may take you longer than the person that you're following, the person that you're trying, to, you know, to to mimic or aspire to, and that's okay. You know, what I'm saying there really should be no time limit of what that may look like. You know, what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, I definitely understand. The me- the biggest connection I made with Chris Hanner and his story, and then in connection with me and my story. But basically, like, I used it because I wanted to see, like, I knew all my pain, and then I could see all his pain and then see where he got to. He he was going through all that pain, doing all this bad stuff to his family, like I was, because I was in it. And mm-hmm. then to see where he was and how, how that love never wavered for him, even when he was sick and was doing the bad things, it gave me a sense of, I need to fix myself. And then that love, that love's still there. Even if I did bad things to people, that love's still there once they see me fix, that I fixed myself. Or made myself, not fixed, but made myself happy right. around that. No, it's dope, though, man. I think you're really refreshing to talk to, though, on the real. You know what I'm saying? You're really concise with your message, which, which is helps, out, helps out people. Some people, you know, they go through what you've gone through, but they can't really put it into words. They really can't explain it. And that's fine. You know, but then people like yourself who can and articulate it so well, that's very helpful, man. You know what I'm saying? It really goes a long fucking way. And especially you doing it through music, that's another level of connection with, with people. Mm-hmm. That's almost like a spiritual connection with some. Oh, yeah. It's a spiritual connection with myself. I, like, when I sit down, like, it's just like, 
like when I was trying to, it's so hard to explain. It's just so refreshing that I can just really sit. Cause I have a very good memory. Like I could think back to when I was like five, six, like things that happened and really no details and stuff. So it's easier for me maybe than some others, but like, it just allows me just to process it again. Like, and process it the right way because now I learned through therapy through being in a hospital how to do it if you're never taught how to do it you won't do it you can't do it yeah. and that's what ultimately creeps up on you later in life let me ask you this about therapy how many therapists did you go to before you found the right one for you uh I talked to like three or four but like two or three of them were just kind of like in like just for like a short amount of time they were kind of until I got placed but once I got placed with my one therapist it was actually a man and which was I wanted to step up to that challenge because throughout my whole life like I think my dad worked a lot my brother was you know he picked on me stayed away from me so it was always like the women in my life that I could talk to or would console me so I've always felt more comfortable talking especially about like what's in me to women like you know ex-girlfriends whatever but i never was comfortable talking to a man i never said any of my problems to friends that were guy friends or my dad or whatever because i just i didn't have that so i only felt comfortable with talking to women so i took that challenge of having a man a male as a therapist to kind of like break out of that shell just i'm literally trying to use everything within my life to better myself climb over the obstacle think back what what has changed whatever just always you know progression so once I met him I was like we were cool like I got comfortable talking around things about him which helped me so I can you know further connect with males down the road because that's huge like I can't just only connect you know on a personal level with females how how would I build you know tight relationships with males in my life so uh, to your point it was kind of right away but I mean, it's okay if you, I, I already, I actually just had a, a doctor uh, that was in, in control of my care for basically in prescription. So my medicine, that control my medicine that I take and she wasn't up to par. So I basically got her off my case and I have a new one like that. Like you should always be doing that. And it's okay. Like maybe you like the doctor for the first year. Now it's not, get a different one. There's a lot of them. Yeah. You got to be comfortable, yeah. I think I think a lot of people are are kind of misunderstanding of therapists, and they assume they have to go with the first one. And I think that's where people kind of get turned off if if they don't connect. You need to connect with that person. Yes, so, yeah. definitely. You got to. That's the main point. Back. Yeah, you got to connect. You got to see. You got to be willing to be open. And it's your point. If after a year you feel like, hey this therapist has done their job for me this year. It looks like I need to get something different because I'm leveling, you know, out of something else. I want to get somebody else. Or get yeah, somebody. or even a, a different perspective. Like maybe, you know, you know how people's perspective are. They're set in one way. Maybe you want to see, you know, see the eyes on the other side. So you go with a different doctor or psychiatrist, whoever you want to see, therapist. I think two people have to understand, like, you know, therapists aren't there just to, you know, either they're, they're there to really guide you through your own thoughts. They're not going to give you advice. I think people get confusion about therapy. Yes. You know, so, <laughs> they're not going to give you life advice. They're not going to fix you. You're honestly there to really kind of question yourself and they challenge you in that way to come, to make, to come out of you, to ask yourself deeper questions that you kind of hide from yourself. They don't want to yeah act. yeah yeah they definitely and they're like it's definitely like the hidden things that you hide from yourself and everyone else and then like they're trying their main job trying to find triggers so like if you're going in there and they're asking you did you get mad this week you say yeah and then you say and you know, explain and you can't explain then it's not going to be that helpful no you have to give the details to the therapist so the therapist can, you know, work through the details, see your reaction, see where your mind, like your process of thought was like in the making that rat brash decision or whatever it may be. So yeah, to your point, like you need the connection and then 
you need to be doing more talking than the therapist is doing. <laughs> Way more. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. You have to. I think, um, yeah, that's, I think that's where a lot of people are miseducated. But then I, I don't think the therapists do a, a good job either as far as in the grand scheme of things, as far as, I guess, communication outward to people about what is it that they truly do. Because it's so, yeah. it's so fragmented. It's very, like, if I have my own office, my own practice, it's just me. It's not like a whole big, you know, kind of corporate type of thing. It's very mm-hmm. fragmented. So, you know, you really have to do research. You really have to go out there and figure it out. Like, even to a point to where if, if it makes more sense for you to go to therapy on your way back home from work. And it's on the path, you know, coming from work, where you have to pass it to force you to go. You may have to do that instead of having it across town, where there's more chance of you going to avoid it. Yeah. No, I, and I'm going to be, I'm actually in an issue with this right now because I have to actually find a new therapist, I'm guessing, because the place that I go to, they actually close at four and I don't get home from work till about five ish. So I haven't really been able to see him in the past like three weeks since school started. So like that it's not like we work together it's great but i have to find someone else because the schedule doesn't link up so yeah being like moving therapists doctors that's fine that's like picking your mechanic pick <laughs> right. the best one <laughs> that, that's an awesome analogy i love that that's dope it's, it's you're right though you have to look at it and pick your own mechanic and you get to a point if it doesn't work with your schedule or let's say you don't click then you find someone that, and you're going to go do a few of them. It's okay. It doesn't mean that you're that fucked up that no one wants to work with you or connect with you. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. No, no, yeah. It's just, <laughs> and and it, it, it also does help, you know, to try to find someone from your walk of life, you know, even if it, you know, emotionally, even spiritually, yeah. even uh, ethnicity-wise, where you grew up. Like, if that's what, like, Find find the person that's completely compatible with you, and they the doctors and the staff there are there to help. So, yeah, I think a lot of people think it's like a like a burden. Like oh, I just I can't tell them I need like uh, you're not gonna hurt their feelings. <laughs> they got their days are stacked every day anyway. Absolutely. So like, <laughs> and it doesn't mean you can't that. return either. You know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You can definitely return back. Let's say after another year, you said, know what? Yeah, I think it's time I want to go back to this person again. You could do that. Yeah. You know, the options are definitely there for you. I think, again, where people have to get their, their, their priorities straight and understand that they have total control of all that. Mm-hmm. And, and I think another thing, though, I think a lot of people get in, a sense, in the mindset of, wow, this just took two months to get scheduled and get this first appointment. I don't want to do that again. But that can't be the – you need what's good for you. So if it does take two or three of two months in between, it, that's what it takes to find the person you want. But yeah, being compatible and being able to, you know, talk freely is the biggest thing for therapy. So let me ask you this. So when are you going to put out a full EP? I actually, I'm, I'm shooting for, I'll say within the next two months. Now that I'm working, I can save up some money for some studio time. That summer's over, so I already have the whole thing written. All the songs are written now. Awesome, awesome. Now, as far as your selection of beats, are you trying to create yourself, or are you getting other people to create for you? Do you find it difficult because the type of lyrics you're putting into it, the storytelling you're putting into it, that nothing's really matching? Uh, I would say I want to eventually learn how to do my own beats, but I don't have the equipment right now so i actually have a friend that doesn't live too far 30 35 minutes he has a home studio it's not like anything elaborate but you know i get to go in there look at it see how things work just you know learning trying to teach myself as as it goes and then eventually yeah i would love to do that because like creating now is so fun for me and if it has to do with my music it's like (laughs) great it's with a cherry on top yeah, that's, that's, like my, that's, that's like myself with podcasts. I can't wait to talk to someone. <laughs> I can't wait. Uh-huh. It's, it's, uh-huh. it's like my new addiction now. It's like I can't wait to schedule somebody, talk to someone brand new, learn from them. You know, um, you know, season one was great for me, and I learned so much from so many people that I'm writing my third book now. You know what I'm saying? 
and and, and putting that all together, but it's called Reflections. It's going to come out next year, um, where I'm going out, you know, we're going to speak, be speaking about all my interactions with my podcasts and my guests and what I've learned. You know what I'm saying? What they enlightened me on. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So this whole this whole past year, like this past season, has been a great, just like me learning and, and absorbing so much and talking to so many different fucking people and it's it's amazing that the the, the 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 common denominator is music. You know, I speak to a bunch of underground hip hop artists because that's just my thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm but I'm also talking about real life, like like your situation, real shit. That let's not sugarcoat it, let's not hide it, let's not present some pretty fucking cookie. Like let's let's show the crumbs, let's show how the kitchen take advantage of. Absolutely. Take advantage of. Yeah. Let's, let's look at this fucking messy ass kitchen that we just front of fucking cooking. You know to make this fucking perfect thing. And it's not perfect. It takes a hell of a fucking mess to create this shit. Mm-hmm. So that, that's, that's the goal, you know, to make sure people see and hear your story. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, without it, where can they really get it from? Some real shit. You oh, know what yeah. I'm Talking to real people. And again, it's that, there's nothing wrong hearing it from someone that's famous and they've gone through it. You know, like, like uh, Demi Lovato, you know, she went through it. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm going through it insecurities by herself body wise just mental state but she's famous it's just, she's almost untouchable for some but and for others she's okay like, like i said earlier like to where you're fresh with it it's just still new for you as well you're still working through it you know what i'm saying it's been a, it's been a couple of years you know what i'm saying and having someone that's thinking about coming out of it and getting some motivation for a person who's who's very fresh in it, it makes a lot of sense. They could really connect even more. Mm-hmm. You know, especially when you talk about your faith, how you got to engage with your faith, to so your music, how you engage with that, and to so your story of just getting a fucking book. You know what I'm saying? And putting some stuff together. You're like, oh shit, like, this is it's coming along. Wow, what, what what do I have here? Let me play with it some more. Mm-hmm. You know, that's some dope ass shit, bro. I I, I definitely fucking applaud you. On that, man. And Thank you. I appreciate it. Definitely applaud your fucking recovery and, and your success is coming, bro. For real. I appreciate it. I thank you for giving me the platform, you know, to share my journey and my story with others. No, that's what I'm here for, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's a platform for the people, bro. And, and for real fucking stories that's going to either, either help people or give them enlightenment if they know someone who is bipolar. Or they may have a hint that someone is is depressed, and you know, everybody tries to be you know Mister and Mrs. Fix it, but if you don't know what the fuck you're dealing with, you can either do mind up doing more damage than good. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? So if you can get that person for professional help, you know what I'm saying? Intervention if that way you work with that person. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it just makes that person dig into a deeper hole. Yeah, like just to add on that, like it worked for me, but I'm like I'm not the same. The reason it worked for me is, like I told you, I was you know I was prepping to stop <laughs> in my mind, but right. once they said you're either doing this or this, and they basically you know put it on whatever you decide is all on top of us. My loved ones, I, I was like, I can't let them down. I can let myself down. In the state I was, I, could, I was fine with letting myself down. But once it became, oh, I'm doing it for myself and them, they know, I got it. Yeah. Absolutely. That's how that helped for me. Just to, you know, feel the love and the concern. And then it just put like, oh, it's for all them as well. So, you know, get out of my self-centered head. That's what I helped with. Yo, we got to stay connected, bro. Definitely. We got to stay connected. I want to get you back on when you get the EP complete. Oh, yeah. I'll be back on. Definitely, bro. So we can definitely check it out in the promoter. Right now, you can find Jacob. Um, Jacob, let me know your, your, your iCloud. Your SoundCloud. My, my SoundCloud? Yeah. Uh, it's actually just numbers right now. Can we post it on the notes or something? Definitely. I'm going to put all the information on the notes. You guys be able to to, to link up on, on on Jacob SoundCloud and really listen in, like really just kind of sit back, listen to what he has. You know what I'm saying? And um, after like really getting to know his story and get to know Jacob right now today is like, you know, you, you can definitely get truth perspective of where he's coming from and where he's headed to. 
You know what I'm saying? And I, I can't really wait for the new music to come out, to be honest with you, bro. So excited. I'm so I I got a lot. A lot of content about a lot of different situations and mental states that I was in in pre addiction, post addiction, trauma throughout my life. So you really can see like the emotion and definitely you can you can hear the story in in almost every song of step by step of how that day or maybe that year whatever that incident played out for sure because i definitely i'm one for the d- details you need the details to learn absolutely absolutely bro yo this is a great convo brother i appreciate yes. you for coming on man i'd love to be on i'll be back i'll be back yeah. shortly you'll be back real short bro we'll get yeah. you on within season two get you back on with the ep get this popping um Johnny Nomad presents. This was Jacob, people. Yo, Jacob, thank you so much, brother. Thank you, Johnny. Take it easy, brother. God bless. You too. Bye. Bye.